the role of James. Is James more important than Peter, which in fact it turns out to be the case by implication as you wrestle with the material. But we've been taught that Peter is the most important person after Jesus. But if you look carefully at the material, he clearly isn't. Acts doesn't think he's the most important person because Acts is interested in one person, one person only. Who's that? Who? Paul. Paul. It gives Peter short shrift. A few things about Peter, and then Peter leaves town, and the next thing you know, it just is zeroes in on its main hero, Paul. So the person who's writing Acts is interested. You have to see the, the motives of the person. And, their aims and what's on their mind. If you don't even think they have an agenda, I think they have an agenda too. But that's just my, um, if you think they don't have an agenda, just what their aims are, what's on their mind. Well, what's on the writer of Acts' mind is Paul. And so we would say, Acts is written from a Pauline perspective. Now, one of the reasons I gave you this compendium here, we won't read them completely ourselves, we don't have time in here, but I'll give you two Two uh, materials here, the Recognitions of Clement, which is only the first book, which is really the most important, and some material from the Homilies of Clement, which have a different perspective than Acts. These are called uh, pseudepigraphic books. These are books that um, Buried in here someplace. Uh, maybe it's in this part here. Here's one. Um, I have one, sorry. So, run out of film, huh? Yes. Because I don't know what we've got that on. So these are the pseudo-Clementines that I've got in the packet here, important chapters from them, and these are uh, a, a narrative. These are actually Hellenistic novels. Uh, now, uh, Hellenist mean they're written in the Hellenistic period, around the Mediterranean Greek, by somebody or some people. And the authorities, the people in power, who control thought, the Dick Cheney's of that period, if you don't like Cheney, I happen to think he's not the ogre people try to make him out to be. And we saw him last night at the convention, if you look, and he hardly looked like he could be an ogre. He looked a fairly mild person, actually. Um, you say, oh, that's just his no, I think that the main problem with these people is that they think they're patriots. I'm not sure that they are, you know, ogres. Uh, but in any case, those who think they are would think they control everything, like Michael Moore would think, and therefore they would be called pseudo. Whatever they said would be pseudo. In other words, you're not to think that these are really something to do with someone called Clement. These are false Clements. Who do you think labeled them? false Clements. The church. Because the church wanted to already make you feel like, one, this was forbidden material, and uh, something that was less something that was less reliable than it might otherwise be thought of being. And uh, it was actually false. They're trying to say it's part of a, we've now got to the point where we have a whole category of writing is called pseudepigraphy. False writings. False writings. Again, it's all writings that pretend to be something, but they're not. 
Well, if you want the opinion of most scholars, the honest opinion of most contemporary modern scholars would be that all these writings are pseudepigraphal. Acts is pseudepigraphal. The Gospels are pseudepigraphal. Writings under a false pen name, if you want to call it that. They may be written by the people they claim to be written by. They may not. Nobody has made any final determinations about that. The same with the pseudepigraphal. The pseudo-clementines are no better or no worse than these other ones. They're all of the same character. The point is that, in, as I told you last time, in the 300s, a church conference was held in which the process began of um, canonizing certain books, and then at the same time declaring other books decanonized or heretical. So the moment you got into a situation where there were true books and false books, then you get into the whole thing about heresy. And when you get into heresy, you start to get into controlling heresy. When you get into controlling heresy, you start getting into burning at the stake. Well, to the fits. So by the time of the Middle Ages, anyone with heretical opinions was considered fair game for burning. And that went all the way up to Joan of Arc. And I mean, you get people being burned up till the 15th century. In England, they were still burning people in the 15th century, in, in, in the 1500s. I think in Italy and Spain till the 1600s. And they have all the records of the Inquisition. And you know, it gets pretty frightening. So but when you think of what went on for 15 or for 13, 12, 13 centuries as a result of this process of Orthodox versus unorthodox, and the uh, lack of Christian charity being displayed by those who were in charge of what was considered to be Christian, it sort of does raise goosebumps on you. On you. And many of you today, I'm sure whatever denomination you are, could, would have been burned back in those days. <laughs> I mean, certainly if you're Protestant, you'd have been burned. So, I mean, if most of you are Protestant in this room or have a Protestant background, you're on the way. And if you're a Catholic who has some issues with the church, you're on the way, too. So, uh, that is if you were important enough to pay attention to. And even people like Galileo were, I would say, silenced, frightened into, you know, submission. He didn't want to be burned. It was be burned or shut up and recant 